Uh, so far in our sermon series on the church, we addressed the following questions. If you remember, just to give us a recap, um, talked about what the church is, uh, what does the church do when it gathers on a weekly basis, who leads the church, how is the church run, pretty much the, uh, the order and the governance of the church, uh, what is a member and what does it mean to be a member, and we talked about who do we serve, why do we serve, and how do we serve. And then just recently, last Sunday, um, we saw from God's Word, mission of the church, which I pray is all according to what God says in His Word. As mentioned earlier, today we end our church sermon series. Um, perhaps there might be another series as we can touch upon some other areas in the church, about the church. As I thought about how to end the sermon series in the church while reflecting on the series thus far, I noticed that it was a lot of, um, like, what um, is what we do, uh, is what we are called to do, and this, uh, around that type of thing. And so I was thinking about, then, who the church is. First, how does the world see the church today? I don't think with high esteem and respect as it once did in the past. Probably more disdain, probably more of just uh, ridicule type of attitude. Maybe perhaps church authority has fallen. Because of that, the church has lost its power. How do we see the church? The world has its views on the church, but how do we see the church? How do we view the church? What comes to our minds? Uh, For many of us, the church has played a major role in our lives. The church has nurtured us in times of grief. The church has walked alongside us uh, during times of confusion and pain. The church has taught us in seasons of growth. We all have special places we visit, either in person or in memory. Uh, I'm not sure if um, uh, many of you would uh, know this place that I'll be mentioning. Uh, so it's, some, it's, it's, it's a place that I went to as a young kid in, my, in the early 90s. So for those maybe a little older might understand this place. For me, one of those special places was a place called Cactus Willies. I don't see a lot of head nods here. <laughs> um, it was basically an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, and uh, I pretty much went there with my family, um, my younger sister, obviously my mom and dad, on maybe every once, once a week or every two weeks when my parents weren't working. Um, going there to eat din- uh, dinner as a uh, family. Um, I remember my dad only eating steak, and that's it, because he thought that's the best way to get the most out of your payment that you pay for the buffet. And me seeing that, doing the same. I remember my sister always going straight for the dessert and only eating dessert. Um, But the memory of spending time as a family, uh, while at the time, as a young child, I didn't know I would miss and remember. It was a place where, oddly enough, a buffet of all places, a place where memories of joy comfort, and oddly, uh, a sense of home that I felt and still remember as. A beautiful place. A lovely place. Now, when we think of the church, does it bring similar thoughts? A beautiful place. A lovely place. Can we say the church is one of those places that brings about a sense of beauty, a sense of love. 
uh, perhaps for many of us, the thought of beautiful or lovely does not come to mind when we think about the church. Instead, we have thoughts of frustrations. We have recollections of pain. I'm not going to list the many things that have given us frustration and pain in the past or most recently. As for those who have been in a Korean-American church, we all have experienced in one way or another those frustrations and pains. We just know. Now, I'm not saying that it's only from Korean-American churches that we've experienced or will only experience frustration and pain. You can go to another Korean-American church. You can go to any American church or any other church. There will be some degree of frustration and pain sooner or later. I'm only focusing on the Korean-American church because that is the context of many of us here. And obviously, this is the church that we're at. I don't want to minimize the frustrations or pains that you've experienced because they're real. But I do want us to not stop or be stuck there, but to grow from there. In today's passage in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, husbands are told to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. Um, And the Apostle Paul kind of expounds a little bit more on that in verse 28, on what that looks like for husbands to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. But for today, we'll be focusing on the latter part here in this passage. First, we see, we ask the question, or we get the answer to the question, how did Christ love the church? We don't have to go too far as God tells us in his word. In verse 25, it says, He gave himself up for her, meaning that Christ died for her, the church. Why? Why did Christ die? Well, we just have to go again to the next verse. Verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse her to make her holy, the church. But why did Christ want to do that? Again, we just have to go with what the passage says in verse 27 that he might present the church, that Christ might present the church, now catch this, to himself. He might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is how Christ loves the church. He died for her. He sanctifies and cleanses her so that he might present the church, his bride, to him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or blemish. The imagery and metaphor of marriage is applied to Christ and the body of believers known as the church. We learned that as we started off the sermon series here. Jesus was willing to die to sanctify and cleanse his betrothed or his soon-to-be bride, so he could present to himself a bride in splendor. Beautiful and lovely. Jesus gained the desire of his heart by giving himself up in suffering for the good of his bride. But how can this be? Doesn't Christ see the church's failures? Doesn't Christ see the sins that so often stains her clothing. But the church is beautiful. But the church is lovely. Because Christ sees his church, his bride, through his cross. It's his sacrificial and sinless blood that washes her clothing as white as snow. And it is the cross that makes her beautiful. It is the cross that makes the church beautiful. 
Church, let us look to Christ and just be captured by his loveliness and beauty. And let us, by God's grace, be a church that is beautiful and lovely, ready to meet Christ as his bride. And let us not be nonchalant about it, like whatever, don't care type of attitude. But instead, let us be diligent in our view of the church and to be the church that is beautiful and lovely. What this means is that we are to be obedient and not say that since, well, Christ is going to do the work anyways, that we can focus on things that we want to do instead or do nothing at all. So with that in mind, a few things I believe is important for us, the church, the bride of Christ, must be diligent in. But as I thought about it, I thought the first thing that came to mind for me as I reflected on it was to be diligent in unity. Uh, Unity among the people of God is a very defining characteristic of the church. And we don't have to read far into the New Testament until we find Jesus speaking of the oneness, the unity of his bride. This unity leads to the breakdown of love, harmony, peace, community, fellowship. It just breaks it all down. So what are some ways, what are some practical ways individual believers can cultivate a true unity within the church? Unity is impossible when we consider ourselves more significant than others. The anthem of disunity is me, myself, and I. We desire our opinions to be heard, our views considered, and then our opinions and our views to be fulfilled. We could go as far as to say that unity requires the destruction of self. It is the complete denial of self to maintain love, fellowship, and peace within the church. I believe that's how we can beautify the bride of Christ. True unity in the church exists only where her members declare with one voice, your word is truth, as we see here in John 17, 17. Based on the inerrant and sufficient word of God, sound doctrine is essential in cultivating true true unity. Here in John 17, Jesus prays that his people will be sanctified in the truth. Sanctify means make holy. It involves setting something or someone apart. Apart from what? From sin. Jesus says that God's word contains the proper ingredients for holiness. As he says here, your word is truth. Therefore, since scripture is the means where believers are made holy, the church must not be and I apologize if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, the church must not be a charcuterie board, if that's the right pronunciation. It's not, it must not be that board of varied beliefs and ideas for you to pick and choose and enjoy, but must be, instead, a set table offering the scriptural nourishment that causes growth into the image of Christ. True unity consists of sanctified truthfulness that bases every ministry that we do as a church, Uh, every sermon that is preached, every decision that is made upon the word of God. And true unity ultimately is cultivated by a daily awareness of our need for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we are united, our oneness reflects Christ. 
who then shines his glory in every part of the church to make the church more and more beautiful and lovely. Second, I believe that we need to be diligent in the truth. We need to be diligent in the truth. Ever since his fall, Satan has continued his strategy of deceit. He has overwhelmed every societal level with confusion and lies. From governments to educational systems to the mass media to the families and also even the church. Satan delights in leading the church away from faithful obedience to God and his word by inviting her members to swim and even enjoy in the waters of lies. So unless we hold on to God's word, the very heart of the church is open to Satan's deception. This is why, surrounded by a world of lies, the church must be ready to answer with God's truth. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul describes the church, as we see here, as the pillar and buttress of the truth. It's not a language that we use today. But Paul's saying here, he's saying that it's the church's task to uphold the truth. The Greek word for buttress means support. So in other words, the Apostle Paul is saying that once God's truth is removed or is not at the church, all its structures, all its programs, all its events, the purpose for existing will eventually crumble if the truth is not there. So how does the church then proclaim God's truth in a world full of lies. First, the church must separate and boldly refuse to be conformed to this present world. We talked about earlier in Ephesians how we're being sanctified, we're being set apart, and instead be continually transformed to be more like Christ. Second, the church must proclaim the countercultural truth of God's word. Of course, in love, before a hostile and unbelieving world. We must lovingly proclaim every command that God gives. We must proclaim what Scripture approves. We must lovingly proclaim even what Scripture calls sin. And third, the church must develop discerning wisdom, looking at everything through the lens of God's word instead of looking at, oh, that sounds good, and taking it as truth. And I stand here before you as my calling as your pastor to herald the word. Herald the truth. The word translated preach is a Greek verb meaning herald, proclaim, and announce publicly. And what is it that I must herald or proclaim to you? It's the word of God. Not just bits and pieces here and there, but all of Scripture. Feeding the flock of God is a fundamental duty in contributing to the beauty and loveliness of the church. Because as God's truth is proclaimed, men and women are saved and sanctified, and the church, again, is made beautiful. And lastly, I believe we must be diligent in how we live. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul urges the the Ephesian believers to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
the metaphor of walking appears throughout Paul's letters and is always connected to, with an urgency to the Christian life. Paul is urging believers back then and to believers today to live in faithfulness and being and living as the body of Christ. Throughout the, Old, uh, I'm sorry, throughout the New Testament, the verb walk means a continuous way of conduct. Like when you're walking, right? You're taking step in front of you one at a time. It's a continuous way of conduct. Other New Testament writers also employ or use the same image of walking to define the life of a believer, a continuous way of conduct. Believers should not continue to live in the sin from which they were rescued or called out from. No one can rightly claim to be a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ who continues to walk or continuous way of conduct in sinful darkness. In contrast to the darkness of this world, the bride of Christ, the church, is to walk in the light. And those who walk in the light do so because the Spirit of God has regenerated them and given them new life in Christ. Is when church members, when church members' feet are firmly fixed on the path of light and continuously walking on that path, their lives will reflect the glory and the majesty of the one who is light. That means your daily actions, your attitudes, the conversations that you have, your thoughts and your works will reflect a light-filled Christ-likeness. And as a result of walking in the light, the body of Christ also walks by the Spirit and therefore is able to walk in a worthy manner. The role of the Holy Spirit is to intimately acquaint us with the Father and the Son to help us. He establishes communion between us and gives us the power to walk. As he molds us into the image of Christ, the Holy Spirit empowers the church as a whole to walk in a Christ-like, worthy manner. While it is the Spirit who gives the power to walk in the Christian life, it is the individual Christian who must put one foot in front of the other. The Spirit fills every true believer, but those individual believers must work, must teach, must pray, must worship, moving the church into a closer walk and joy in Jesus Christ. Uh, the Spirit doesn't work for us. The Spirit doesn't preach for us. The Spirit doesn't evangelize for us. The Spirit doesn't even worship for us. The Spirit empowers His people to do all these things, but it is their responsibility to do the walking. A church that is beautiful in the eyes of a bridegroom, her bridegroom, is a church that is walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It is living lives that regularly confesses sin and desires to walk according to the Spirit and not according to our flesh. Living lives that reflect Christ and points back to Him. Is living lives that yearn to know Christ deeper and have his gospel power flow in them for Christ's good pleasure. Is living lives that display to all who see that the church is genuinely walking in a worthy manner. And while the church may not, perhaps in our eyes right now, look lovely and beautiful, and perhaps it's going to take some time, the wonderful Truth is that Jesus Christ sees his church as lovely and beautiful. In my previous church in Maryland, um, while I was serving there, 
I was occasionally asked to help with the audio video for weddings held at the church. I got paid with cash and food, so it was pretty good. It wasn't just food, so I mean, that was good too, but the cash part was good too. Of course, for uh, many of us, I'm sure we've all uh, gone to weddings. We all know one of the highlights, or perhaps the highlight of wedding ceremonies when the bride enters. What happens when the bride enters? Well, there's music playing, right? On cue. And the door is open, and everyone stands up. You don't even have to say it, people just, just know. Everyone's attention at that point is on the bride, as it should be. One time, I thought it would be interesting to see the bridegroom during that moment when the bride entered. I was curious to see the bridegroom's face as he was seeing his soon-to-be wife, bride, and walking towards him. So, at one wedding, I looked at the bridegroom, and I think I was the only one. And I saw a face filled with just happiness, a face just full of love and anticipation of his soon-to-be wife walking towards him. As I thought about that, I was imagining Christ looking at his bride, the church with love and delight. Church, let us also aim to have a view of the church as lovely and beautiful and aim to, in unity, in truth, and walking in a worthy manner and humility, be a church that is lovely and beautiful, ready to meet our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves his church. Let's take some time to pray in response to what we just heard from God's word this morning. For those joining us for the first time, uh, this is simply just a time of prayer. To what you just, in response to what you just heard, whether it was the beginning, middle, end, or maybe in between, wherever it was that you heard God's voice, whether it was a confession, there is something you're thankful for, perhaps there's clarity needed to something that you may be a little bit confused about, or perhaps you're just simply going before the Lord because you're not sure what to say or don't know him anything to say, you can go before the Lord in silence. But whatever it is, I pray that you don't dismiss it or think that it's not important or maybe that it's just dumb. It's not. You can go before the Lord with it. Would you pray in response? Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Thank you for speaking to us once again. Lord, as we have wrapped up this short series on the church, Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to be obedient, Lord, to your word. Help us, Lord, to now see more and more of who the church is. Lovely and beautiful. Help us, Lord, because for many of us, 
that's difficult. But God, may we look to you as you see us, the church, through the cross. And you loved us to the point of death for your glory and for our own good. And Lord, you don't stop there. You sanctify us and you cleanse us. You purify us. So that you, pre- that you can bring us to yourself in splendor. Without any wrinkles, spots, any blemish. And may we, Lord, as a church, aim to be a church that is lovely and beautiful in humility and unity in the truth and walking in a worthy manner. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.